photojournalism. I, I've been teaching high school for the last two years now. Um, and currently I, I teach, I'm, I'm really teaching my students now um, how to prepare for the part 107 and, and using uh, piloting and engineering and repairing drones right now, so. That's great, thank you. Ooh. Anybody else wanna jump in, you're welcome to, but not required. If someone can tell me if they can see my screen, I would appreciate. I don't know if I got it up there or not. I can see your screen. A um, little different aspect, I think, a little addition to the education from the education world. Uh, I work for 911 in the DFW region, and um, we are looking to um, partner with uh, schools to uh, create 3D imagery of the, school, of the school buildings and the campuses to put into our, our uh, call taking centers uh, so that we can um, dispatch can actually see uh, where the calls are coming from uh, within buildings and what floor and so forth. And so that's our interest in, in 911 is we're interested in, in and um, trying to pique some interest in our local school districts to create some of these programs. Okay, that sounds great. That is a different use. All right. All right, I think we will kick it off uh, as folks come in, uh, they can join us. So um, my name is Ron Pointer and I am owner and founder of On Point. And uh, with me today is Michelle Victor with PCS Adventures. So both of our companies are in the education space um, with a uh, fairly long history of including uh, drones unmanned <clears throat> systems. So I guess it's unperson systems uh, in, uh, in classrooms. So I'm gonna kick it off and go through some material here for about uh, 15, 20 minutes, and then I'll hand it off to Michelle. Uh, she'll go through um, her part of it, and then we'll have it open at the end for about 10 minutes or more of uh, Q&A. So we'll just kick it off. All right, so one of my favorite little things to show um, with kids is uh, some of our early pioneers of unmanned systems. So this is Julius Neunenbronner. And so Julius was a, an Austrian pharmacist and he had carrier pigeons and he was trying to train his carrier pigeons to deliver prescriptions to his patients. You can imagine it probably didn't work out all that well, but he was also an amateur photographer. So he figured out a way to mount these little cameras onto some of his carrier pigeons. So if you look at the bottom, uh, bottom of the screen on the right, you see three of his pigeons with cameras mounted to them. And the picture above, it's pretty grainy, but that is a castle in Austria. And if you look on the far right side, you see feathers. And that's a picture taken by one of his birds. So I credit Julius Junebrunner as the um, founder of Unmanned Aerial Systems. So kind of a fun little tidbit. All right, so some of you probably, if you're on the conference this morning, saw this slide. Um, I just kind of want to reiterate, it's really kind of important uh, that you kind of have an idea of what you want to, you know, why you want to bring drones into the classroom, what are you trying to achieve, uh, that'll help you make a decision on what's the right platform, okay? Um, again, show this other, we, we stress pretty significantly with the students that these are tools and not toys, even when students are pretty young. Um, when they get them when they're in you know elementary school they probably are more toys for them but as you start teaching it in the classroom it's important to 
to stress that these are being used as a, as a for a purpose. They're a tool. All right. Talked a little earlier as well about whether you're going to go with a system that's more for indoors or for outdoors. Um, I'm going to focus a little bit more on outdoor systems today, uh, as we talked about this earlier. Um, our business has been really centered around kits. Uh, we also have had offered, you know, the full, full, fully manufactured or pre-manufactured aircraft as well. Um, in career technology education programs, um, we see a lot of interest in these kind of aircraft that are manufactured, ready to go. Um, they fall essentially some of our almost consumer when you get to the small ones like the maybe Mavic Mini is, is pretty much kind of a consumer drone. Uh, when you start getting up to the Phantom or a Mavic 2, you're getting into what we kind of call a prosumer. Um, they're, they're professional consumers or they're uh, maybe a notch below commercial, though I do know a fair number of commercial uh, drone operators who use uh, Phantom 4s and Mavic 2s. They're very capable aircraft. Um, um, I'm not going to go a whole lot more into this other than to say that uh, drones for coding are real popular in schools, as well are the small ones for doing drone racing, specifically indoor racing. And these small ones are not, they're, they're the size of the palm of your hand, so they're very small. Uh, they can go fairly fast, but their mass is so small, they don't, if they hit something, they really don't do any damage. So they're, they're good systems for indoors. Start talking about outdoor systems. <clears throat> um, there's a lot of really good capabilities in, in, uh, built into these aircraft and a lot of different applications. I think Michelle's going to talk a little bit more about that later on. So I'm not going to get into it too heavy. Just know that um, a couple of areas are fairly specialized. Agriculture is very specialized, whether it's the, like the one in the bottom that's a, essentially a crop duster uh, sprayer or there are others that use um, multi-spectral cameras and imaging and very sophisticated software to analyze um, growth in the fields. Um, those systems are expensive. Um, I have uh, seen them used in ag departments. Uh, I had a, um, uh, a rural school in Oregon who bought a couple uh, and it was to kind of teach that level of sophistication to the uh, students that were studying agriculture in their, in their district. So they're very specialized. When you get into motion picture filming, um, that is a very specialized thing as well. The average uh, drone is never going to be, you know, it isn't quite capable sometimes of doing some of the shots that real videographers want to do. Um, so they tend to be some very specialized. And then there are others that are really kind of nuts and bolts aircraft. So uh, I think an example of that might be a Phantom 4, the new version, uh, the Inspire, the Matrice line uh, by DJI. Uh, Skydio has a uh, enterprise level drone. Um, Parrot has enterprise level drones. And those are really more for aerial mapping, surveying, and some of the other uh, applications that there are. Uh, but they're more wide ranging. You can use that kind of an aircraft for aerial inspections, mapping, surveying. Um, they're also some that are kind of specialized or you tend to be used more in law enforcement or public safety. Um, so there are some that can do a little bit of everything there, but there aren't too many that can do every application and do it very well. So we'll move on past that. Um, I'm not gonna go into coding a whole lot. We talked about that a little earlier on. Just know that if it's an aircraft if you want to introduce coding, uh, the Tello, the Tello ADU are a very good aircraft for that. Um, if that's something you're real interested in, then I would recommend uh, tuning in to um, um, Michelle Vickery and Dennis Baldwin with Drone Blocks. Um, uh, that is really their thing there, uh, and their system is, is very good. You can code all the way up into Python. So. Again, basic indoor stuff. Uh, the only thing I recommend and we'll go to it i got in a farther slide is it's important to set up safety guidelines and boundaries even when the students are young operating in a classroom and operating drones that are very small um setting up kind of good guidelines that they'll as they stay if they stay in drones or if the school progresses 
and they go to outdoor drones, these kind of safety best practices are good things to start and start early. So we'll, I get a little bit more on that later. So outdoor kits, we'll talk a little bit more about this. So um, the advantage of these kits, as I said before, they're, they're real hands-on experience. I mean, they have to put them together. Um, <clears throat> I know um, the uh, RubyQ is a kit that has to be built. Uh, our, our aircraft are all kits, and there are other companies that make them as well. Um, but they're good because they tend, they're team sport, team projects. They have to work together. Um, they're building the hardware. It gives an opportunity to explain all the different components and what they do. Uh, their software they have to use. And keep in mind that even with the small indoor racing drones, those still, they can still connect those up to a laptop, use um, some free downloadable software. And you can walk through and kind of explain to them and show the different components and how they're interacting and kind of show the uh, setup that's used. And even though the software is different, whether you're using a NASA system, a Pixoc system, uh, or a Betaflight or iNav, one of these other ones, they're still all about configuring and setting things up. So they're, they're real good systems to have. And as I mentioned before, you get great positive feedback because when they first try to fly it, if something's wrong, it could flip upside down, never get off the ground. So it, it provides some real time um, and real world experience with having to figure out you know, what went wrong or maybe nothing went wrong. That's, you, you tend to learn more, at least I certainly do, from things that go wrong as opposed to things that go right. So, uh, and the kits, like I said before, they're upgradable. If you're using a fairly basic flight controller, um, you know, for the first iteration, um, follow on customers of ours have upgraded to more advanced flight controllers uh, and, other, and other things to add some depth to their program and to increase um, the challenge for the students. Um, Again, the consumer level drones, um, probably the bottom left, the Phantom 4, it's probably a pretty high end consumer drone, frankly. Uh, the Inspire and the Matrice are definitely commercial level drones. And then the bottom right is one that's by Xfold, and that's a motion picture drone. Um, it's got eight motors, um, it's got dual remote controls, one that operates the camera, one that operates the aircraft. So it's definitely a more complex machine. Uh, but these are out of the box, ready, generally ready to fly, put the propellers on them and, and off they go. Tested good reliable systems. Um, and in CTE programs, we see uh, a fair amount of interest in these, not the higher end ones, the Matrice 300s or the 600s, they're fairly expensive systems, uh, but we do see a, um, the Phantom 4 and the uh, Mavic 2s, we see a lot of interest in those. So anyway, good and well suited. Uh, I'll, I'll go past this one again, but uh, there's certainly a variety and not all drones are multi-copters. So it's, a, it's the ability in your program to add other systems uh, as your program expands or you get a little bit bigger with it. I'm going to talk a little bit about parts. That's one thing we didn't go over in the first group. So these are motors, propellers, electronic speed controllers, batteries, power distribution systems. So you can kind of see the motors come in a variety of sizes. The one on the far left, someone's holding up with two hands. The one uh, uh, over two to the right, it's almost about the size of a fingernail in diameter. And so the small racing drones are using those brushless motors, um, but they are varying sizes. And um, there's a whole lot of computation between what size motor versus what size propeller versus what size battery we need to do it, how big the ESC needs to be. And so there's a whole lot of calculations, a whole lot of planning that they would have to do. They want to design their own, let's say that you give them a challenge, it's got to be able to lift five pounds and keep in the air for 10 minutes. Um, you know, they can get a bigger motor, but then what's that going to mean for propeller size? and the speed the motor has to turn. And for that, you're gonna need how big a battery. So there can be a lot of calculations they have to do if they're just given a problem to solve and figuring that out. Um, but also uh, with a lot of experiments you can do, you, you know, once you have a drone set, you, know, you don't need to go out and buy all these different pieces and parts. It's just a matter of figuring out what's an experiment that will work with the equipment and hardware that you have. So different systems, different, 
different uh, processors. The item on the far right, uh, upper right, is a, a four in one ESC. So that board will control the motors of all four motors for a quadcopter. Just below it is a single electronic speed controller. And so different builds require different kinds of uh, systems, uh, different kinds of uh, components. And propellers, you, the ones on the left are two bladed, the ones in the center are three bladed, there are four bladed, there are folding propellers. There's a lot of different options out there for those. And you get more, more drag from a three bladed propeller than you do from a two bladed propeller. And so it's a matter of figuring out there again, okay, well, I get more drag. So that means I need a motor that's got, that's got to handle more power. So to power that I need a bigger battery and a big battery is way more. So it's, there's a lot of calculations they can do to get into that. Frames. So here you see in the upper right, I got a tricopter, you've got quadcopters, folding quadcopters, hexcopters, folding hexcopters. And then the bottom left is an octocopter and that's considered, it's a coaxial octocopter. So it's four arms, but motors top and bottom. So you can do all kinds of things. I have seen students build quadcopter frames out of plastic toolboxes, bicycle wheels, milk cartons, anything that you can strap four motors, a flight controller and a battery onto, you can pretty much get into the air as long as you, it, it won't exceed the, the physical limitations of the motors and the batteries. So there are a lot of times will schools will purchase just all of those hardware pieces and have the students design, build their own. They can make them out of wood, they can make them out of plastic, they can 3D print them. Um, you know, there's a lot of things they can do. Um, so many schools have 3D printers now. There's a lot of capability you have to be able to do those kind of things. So <clears throat> they don't have to be limited to a frame they can buy off the shelf. Uh, but when you're starting a program, a friend you can buy at the shelf, at least when you get all the pieces and parts and put it all together, you can be reasonably sure that someone has designed it so that it will actually fly and it's been tested. So um, they're, they're good to start a program with, but down the road, if you want to evolve to where you're making your own, um, then, then that's, a, that's a, it's a great evolution to have and a great uh, challenge to add to the school, to the students. Flight controllers, I kind of say that towards the end because it's probably one of the most important. So there's a couple of different types. You've got ones that are proprietary. So at the top, you've got the NASA system. It's made by DJI, it's proprietary. That is, and the ones I put in here are ones that are more common to education. Um, uh, there are many companies that make flight controllers. Um, the NASA system and the other to the right, the Eagle Tree system, they're both about $200, $230, though I think I heard recently that um, that Eagle Tree Vector uh, actually went out of business. So uh, sorry to see that happen. Um, there are other flight controllers out there, but they get significantly more expensive. Um, uh, NAS, there's a new DJI one called the N3. There are, there are certainly others, but the price just keeps going up as you get to those. You cannot get into the code with those. You can't access um, uh, any of the, there's no data logs, things like that to get into with those. Um, the group in the center are all uh, of a PixHawks variety. So they started off years ago, they were called APM. Uh, they're commonly called PixHawks. They are an open source system. Now there's advantages and disadvantages to an open source system. The open source system uh, allows you to, or, um, you can't get into the hardware. Anyone who wants to make a Pixox flight controller can get the recipe, the ingredients to, and build one themselves. Uh, part of the problem is that there's plenty of people that do that. And so the quality can vary significantly between manufacturers. So it's the system on the left, the cube, uh, and there's different colors. There's a cube orange, a cube blue, a cube yellow. There's a bunch of different colors. Um, it just has to do with some of the internal components inside, essentially. Um, but uh, the carrier board it mounts to there, and um, but there are higher levels of quality than others. So all I would say is that the more the Pixhawks probably cost, probably the better it probably is. The cube system is very good. Uh, the flight control on the far right is a Pixhawks 4. That's made by a company called Hollybro. They make good equipment as well. It's just worth your time to do some research on quality before you, before you go off buying 
a Pixox is. You can get a Pixox flight controller for $70 and it's probably not worth 20. So it's just worth doing a little investing. And then the ones on the bottom are more ones that we see for uh, smaller systems and for racing drones. So um, they aren't, they don't necessarily have a name. Uh, the one down in the center is a uh, built for the INAV system, which allows for waypoint flying a few other things. Um, and the one on the right, it's a little hard to tell, but that is incredibly small. That is about 16 millimeters point to point on those, on those nylon bolts you see. They are very small. They can be very small. Um, um, one thing also I don't recommend, um, these really small ones are incredibly difficult to solder. And if your students don't know how to solder and you don't feel overly comfortable with it, it's not a system you wanna get involved in. Get one that's already put together because soldering those really fine points like that can be difficult and students have significant challenges doing that. So here's some of the software I talked about. So the top two are generally used for configuring uh, racing drones. Um, I know uh, the, the RubyQ, I believe, uses iNav. Uh, and so they can, they can configure many different kinds of drones, but they tend to use those smaller flight controllers. The software pictures you see on the bottom are used for Pixhox flight controllers. The one on the left is called Mission Planner. The one on the right is called Q Ground Control. There's a, there's a couple of others out there. Um, these are all free downloads to use to set everything up. But the students, if they're setting up a racing drone, or a NASA system or a Pixhawk system, they still have to go through and do a lot of configuration settings. And it's a great, uh, a great experience, a great way to give them some software experience and some hardware experience in the drone, in the drone field. Um, so with some of the aircraft you can do, uh, they do outdoor flights and they have uh, telemetry systems that will feed back. So that bottom right uh, image it shows the path the aircraft is going on. It's following that yellow line. And the red line that's coming off from that essentially is the heading. That's where it's, that's where it's pointing. So you get some really great telemetry uh, on the aircraft provided it is equipped with that. And the Pixhawk system, you can get it for that. And I think some of the, some of the other systems, some of the INAV systems as well. Um, so common commercial drones, I don't know if we talked about this before or not, but uh, upper left is the Matrice, um, uh, I believe that's the um, uh, 400 or 210, the Phantom. Then there's the zip line drone that we saw earlier today. Um, the one on the upper right is a new uh, enterprise drone from Skydio. They're a US company. And the bottom one is one by Parrot. And Parrot is now making their aircraft in the US as well. So some, some ones you may end up seeing. Um, most of these systems are used tablet-based uh, apps for flight planning. So that center bubble, um, that is a program called Maps Made Easy, where you're essentially laying out an area you want the drone to fly. And that symbol, that triangle is the drone. And each dot there is where it's taking a picture to create a three-dimensional map. Um, so it's very tablet-heavy based as far as flight planning, and, and but it's, it's very robust in the information that it provides to you. Just real quickly, some of the components that make these drones work are this that you'll see on there, some of the sensors, accelerometers, magnetometers, gyros, barometers, uh, acoustic sensors, LIDAR and GPS. So um, accelerometers, they, they measure how much movement there is and that's how the aircraft can correct its position or correct its, its attitude based on that. Magnetometers, it's an electronic compass that helps with heading. Uh, gyroscopes, they're electronic gyroscopes that uh, help with its orientation. Barometers help measure its altitude. Uh, that uh, little chip in the center there, I believe is a barometer. They're incredibly small. Uh, and then there's other sensors as well, but they all help keep it all together. GPS is one of the bigger ones that we see as well, but they're also using a lot of AI and advanced technology. So um, what's kind of nice is um, some of the contributing technology for these uh, the smartphone, uh, you can kind of see when you, you know, everybody has a smartphone these days, you rotate it over and the screen rotates. Well, it's accelerometers in there uh, that understand that you change your orientation and the microcomputer inside that phone changes the image to suit the angle. Uh, that's a little hard, this, the one on the left um, that soldier's holding a handheld GPS. 
So that is a desert storm picture. So that picture is what come, coming close to 30 years old now. Um, but when we were in desert storm, we literally had some of those strapped to the dashboards of our helicopters. It was the most advanced thing back then. And it was the size of two bricks. Um, so now, uh, now it's down inside your smartphone and it's, it's incredibly tiny. So just some things that contributed to that. Um, I'd like to just talk just for a second on safety. I know I'm eating into Michelle's time. I apologize. But a couple of things that I think are important to go over that you understand when you're going into to introduce <clears throat> drones into your program. First of all, that bottom left image is a memo that the FA put out in 2016. And it essentially acknowledges that teachers um, are going to use drones in their school programs and that they're considered um, recreational users in that memo. Now, that memo is now four years old. Um, I haven't seen any new guidance from the FAA on this, but I can tell you from a best practices standpoint, if you're gonna be flying outside, it is best, especially if you're in any kind of an urban area that uh, your teachers go through the 107 uh, training. Um, it's, it's not that difficult. And if you're going to have a drone program with you know, aircraft you're gonna fly outside, your students are gonna to have to get that license if they wanna use these things for, for any kind of business. So it's, it's something to, I would put some serious consideration in it. Um, again, I'm not sure how current that memo is or if there's something that supersedes it. I haven't seen anything, but um, uh, I don't know. Just from best, best practice standpoint, that's something that you should be aware of that a 107 license something that's important. Um, as far as the best practices, if you look at that center image, it's got, looks like a round cylinder and looks like little people made of triangles there. So that is really kind of to represent uh, a setting up a safe flying area. So you set an aircraft out about 20, 30 feet, you set a line of flags, come back another 15, 20 feet, set another line of flags, come back another 40, 50 feet, depending on where you are, set another line of flags. So we set the drone on the far side of the safety line. We set the people on this side of the pilot line and you have at least a 15 to 20 foot buffer between where the drone is and where the people are, where, where the operators are, where you and your students are gonna be. And the FA recognizes this as a best practice. It's something that the Academy of Modern Aeronautics are doing and they've been flying remote control airplanes since the forties or thirties. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a good practice to get in. That far line is really for spectators. Um, so we set it up so that no one crosses the safety line unless the instructor's taking them across to change a battery or something along those lines. And when you're flying, everything, everyone is on this side of the pilot line. Uh, it's a good practice to have. And I recommend setting up something similar on a smaller scale if you're going to do drone flying indoors. It's, you know, the drones are small indoors. You're probably not going to hurt anybody. But if they're going to progress from there to an outside uh outside uh, flying program uh, in, in future years, it's good that they at least saw what right is, is supposed to look like. So we recommend that. Um, training's important. That's what the picture on the, just to the left of that is implying. Um, the bottom left picture essentially is showing geofencing. Uh, a lot of software will allow you to set a geofence where the aircraft will not fly outside of that ring. And you can set an altitude limit as well so that it can't fly above a certain feet. We typically recommend we set an altitude of about 30 meters and a distance of about 50. So you're talking about a space about 100 feet by about 300 feet, which is about the size of a football field. Uh, that way you make sure that you're not flying it over a neighbor's house or in front of a school bus and you're keeping it within line of sight. Last thing I'll touch on briefly are these uh, batteries. Uh, the upper left picture shows one on fire. Now, this was I'm sure intentionally set on fire but um, the lithium polymer batteries that the drones that fly outdoors use are pretty powerful things. And so just observing battery safety, there's just a little more to it when you're gonna do uh, flying outdoor drones. I think that is the last of my slides, that is it. So um, I'm glad to take some questions after, we're, after Michelle's finished on this, but at this point I'm gonna hand it off to Michelle. Thanks so much, Ron. This is Michelle here from PCS. 
Um, let's see if we can get a slide share going here. Let's see. I might have to stop my slide share. Let me. Uh, let's see. Is that coming through for you guys okay? Not yet. Okay. Yes. Oh, there it is. Yeah. You're good. Okay. Awesome. Um, so like Ron said, I'm presenting from Boise, Idaho. I work at PCS Adventures um, and we like Ron manufacture drones specifically for STEM education. Um, so I feel like our companies are pretty unique in the drone space. A lot of the other manufacturers are commercial. Um, so I'm hoping to expand on what Ron shared, some considerations. I completely agree with his first point that kind of that core question is, you know, what is your goal for a drone program? What are you trying to get out of it? Um, so I'll kind of share some different options that might meet some different educational needs, depending on what your goal is. Um, a little bit of background. I lead our STEM development division at PCS. Um, we've been doing hands-on STEM education for over 30 years um, and got into drones within the last five years. Um, we started just with a summer camp that we were running. We wanted to do it with drones, used off-the-shelf drones, um, and had a lot of fun. You can see the kids in this picture are really young. Um, but as we got into it and kind of saw the limitations of what was available at the time, um, we were lucky and got to team up with a local drone manufacturing company called Thrust UAB. Um, at that time, they were putting out a pro racing drone. Um, it looks a little dated now, but at the time it was really cutting edge and we were able to partner with them to kind of merge the excitement of racing drone technology and develop something that would work really well in an educational context. Um, so that's where we're coming from. You can see Conrad here is one of our engineers. Um, Conrad taught me to fly and has also taught his kids to fly. Um, so we just really believe that there's a lot of really cool things that you can do, um, specifically with racing drones, but also with drones in general. Um, so just big picture, I mean, people get into drones for so many different reasons. Um, one, of course, is that it's a really great platform for teaching STEM. Um, so science, technology, engineering, math, there's so much applied with drone technology. Um, and then on top of that, all of the soft skills, you know, I know some of the folks shared earlier about what they need in industry, especially if you're working with elementary or middle school kids, it's so hard to know what the latest technology will even be. So we really believe in those soft skills as something that will set them up for success, no matter where the technology goes. Um, and then of course, there's the immediate career opportunities using drones. And so I'm gonna walk through kind of drones organized by career clusters um, and kind of some different considerations depending on the application that you're looking at. Um, but the last one I wanna hit on here too is that drones are fun. And I completely agree with the mindset that they're not toys, they're tools, um, but that engagement factor is huge. Um, so we work with programs from, you know, CTE, where kids are going on to get their part one or seven or going on to get additional education. Um, but we also hear from a lot of folks that said, you know, once I started my drone club in my after school program, suddenly I got a whole bunch more kids enrolling and then they joined the robotics team and then they joined our videography team. So that engagement can kind of be the thing that opens the door um, to get kids into all sorts of different areas of STEM. You know, and then of course, if you're in a classroom setting, we hear, gosh, even from elementary teachers that say, you know, my kids are staying after school to finish their math homework because they really want to fly drones tomorrow. So I feel like that part too is also really essential um, just to get kids interested. And then from there, there are so many opportunities for them. Um, so a little bit about, you know, what we offer. Um, our experience has been working both with indoor drones, um, kind of like Ron mentioned, we have some curriculum that works really well with Tello or similar drones. Um, and then of course, working with outdoor kind of more advanced hands-on drones that stretch up into the middle and high school grade levels. Um, so we've had a chance to fly a lot of the different drones, um, to test them out in the field. And so, the way I like to think about it is you're thinking about, you know, what is your goal for your program? Um, is that drones are usually designed to do one of these three things and that some drones are really designed for a creative purpose, for storytelling. 
Um, other drones are really designed to collect data, um, whether that's photos or, you know, physically collecting a specimen to be analyzed. Um, and other drones are vehicles, whether it's transporting cargo, transporting a person, um, or, you know, transporting itself for the sport. So I want to start with this first one, drones for storytelling. Um, and this application, of course, if you're teaching photography, film, journalism, broadcasting, um, another unique one would be performing arts. Um, so this would be, say, drone light shows or drones being used in theater as kind of a set design aspect. Um, so these drones are obviously optimized to have really super stable controlled flight because um, you're trying to stabilize that camera to get a really good high quality picture. Um, so Ron shared kind of several examples from industry. I've got those over on the right. Um, DGA obviously is a huge leader here and they're always competitors. Um, I also included the Lucy drone from Verity Studios. Um, Intel would be the other big kind of uh, provider in this space of drone entertainment, which is kind of its own thing. And then on the left, I've got kind of the educational analog of if you're trying to do something similar in education, of course, some programs are going to go all in and get industry grade drones. Um, but especially if you're working with younger students or just getting started, um, if you're looking to do storytelling, photo, video, the Tello or Tello EDU are obviously great choices. Um, Tello EDU has the advantage of having swarm control. So if you're wanting to do some sort of choreographed performance, um, it works really well for that. Um, the Tello is also great as an introduction to DJI drones. It's obviously the cheapest, so it's the best one to get your crashes out of the way on. Um, and then lots of programs kind of work their way up the progression of different levels of photo video drones. So if that's the direction you wanna go, um, obviously you're gonna to wanna to really look at really stabilized flight, camera quality, video quality. Um, a whole nother direction in industry would be drones for data collection. Um, so often the entry point for a lot of people is real estate photography. Um, so at this point, your data is truly just a still image, a photo, um, but the photos can really get more and more complex. Um, so another example, there are so many cool stories from scientific research. Um, a really cool one I heard recently, there was a team from Stanford down in Antarctica, and they were trying to count the penguin population there. Um, so obviously doing this on foot is logistically really challenging. Um, and you can do it by helicopter, but helicopters are loud and they disturb the penguins. So they had taken down actually a fleet of drones that flew together um, and had an algorithm pre-programmed that kind of maximized their flight time, obviously flying in the cold. Um, it's really challenging. Um, and then they also had some AI built into their algorithm to help automate the counting of the penguin populations. Um, so photos for scientific research obviously can yield a lot of data. Um, another aspect would be search and rescue. So at this point, you might not be using just a standard camera. These might be using an infrared camera um, to really track the spread of fire if you're doing a fire management or just search for a missing person. Um, drones have also been brought in for that and been really successful. Um, and once you get into this level, often there's some supporting software. So other examples would be in construction. You have a drone that's flying, taking a bunch of photos. It'd be way too much data for any one person to sort through, but there's software that stitches those photos together um, and can create a really cool 3D model that you can use to track the progress. Um, same thing for fire management, like I mentioned. Um, you know, you can have drones going out collecting data that can inform where teams need to go, what fires to manage. Um, and then of course, agriculture, us being in Idaho, this is a really big one. Um, and these cameras are going on beyond visible light. They might be using um, multi-spectral cameras and that allows them to collect some really specific data about which crops are doing well, maybe where there needs to be more or less water. Um, and again, that's supported by some really quality, you know, data management systems or processing software. 
Um, another one too is natural resources. So these are often using the same sort of sensors as in agriculture, but it might be tracking a reforestation effort to see how successful that's been over time, getting way more data than you could possibly get on foot in the same amount of time. Um, so in terms of career opportunities, um, really being able to process and work with data is what we hear is one of kind of the most exciting areas and one of the most skilled. Um, these drones are really complex. Um, and really, if you're looking to emulate this in an educational setting, you know, again, you're starting with photos and videos, doing inspection challenges, doing counting sort of challenges. So even something as simple as a tello, you can really simulate some real world scenarios without having, you know, a $5,000 drone. And then that leads us to the last one, which is drones as vehicles. So as a company that got started in drone racing, this one is obviously one of our favorites. Um, but of course, I mean, there's a ton going on with logistics, transportation of people and goods. There are even warehouses that have drones flying inside of them to help manage. Um, so we saw from Zipline earlier, I mean, there are lots of really cool applications of drones being done more and more as we figure out the infrastructure to support that. Um, I do want to talk a little bit specifically about drone racing, um, especially if you're working at the younger levels or in an out of school space. Um, this is obviously one of the most fun ways to fly. It has all the appeal of sport. It's high speed and it can be a really great entrance to get kids who maybe wouldn't otherwise be interested in STEM to start exploring those career opportunities. So if you're looking into drones as vehicles, um, you obviously have some choices. You can start indoors, um, like the students who shared earlier, there are lots of great indoor racing drones. Um, Ron touched on this earlier, but to reiterate, there's a, a huge difference between starting with a drone like a Tello. Um, that's really gonna fly like a photo video drone. It's really easy, it's really stable. Anybody can be successful in five minutes. Um, something more like the drone in the bottom left um, that's designed to be a racing drone. Um, those are not as easy to fly, which if you only have five minutes can be frustrating, but if you have a whole year, um, it's a really cool skill your students can work on. Um, we really see our RubyQ as kind of a transition drone um, that you can use to start flying outside, build skilled piloting, but kind of with some training wheels built in. Um, and that obviously, I mean, commercial applications of this can get really complex from zipline to air taxis to Amazon delivery drones. So I know we want to have some time to do questions at the end, but I want to touch on a few other specific details. So kind of to sum up those previous slides as you're considering, you know, what drone is right for me. Um, obviously, some key considerations are time frame. You know, like I mentioned before, if you're doing a one day outreach project and you need kids to be successful with drones in that one day, you're obviously going to want something farther to the left, something like a Tello, something that's stabilized, easy to fly. Um, if you have more time than that, your kids are probably going to max out their abilities on the Tello really fast. Um, so it's great to have something that gives them a chance to really build their piloting skills. Um, the other one, of course, is age. We've done tellos as young as fourth grade, and I've heard of people going even younger. I mean, because they're just such natural pilots, they pick it up so fast. Um, obviously, as your drones get more complex and more expensive, people tend to use those with their older students. And then the other part is what skills you want to focus on. Um, if you really want to use drones as a way to teach coding, um, you know, a Tello or a similar drone that can be coded is totally the way to go. If you're hoping to start a racing club and use that kind of sport team environment to bring kids into your program, um, you're going to want a drone that has that kind of technology. Um, Ron touched on this too, but, you know, both of our companies have also put together kits. And so something you can build from the ground up. So if you're hoping to support your kids to go on to build their own drones. Um, in that case, you're definitely gonna want something like the Ruby Q, something where kids are getting hands-on, getting some experience, learning the parts and pieces. You know, and of course, if you're a really advanced CTE program, you're gonna wanna look at an industry grade drone or something similar that's gonna match 
what they're going to see. So kind of at the top, it really depends on are you trying to just give kids kind of a general awareness of drone technology? Great. You know, with something like a Ruby Q or a kit, you can explore, get some more hands-on experience, and then, you know, all the way up to true career preparation. So our area of expertise is obviously um, this middle section of really getting kids to explore different aspects of STEM or explore different career tracks. Um, so I want to touch on a couple specific points that we found to be especially important in STEM education programs. Um, so this is our platform. I'll skim over this one real quick so that we can get into some of these specific points, but we obviously have a first person view camera. Um, so like folks have mentioned before, this means you aren't seeing the drone as it's flying, you're seeing it on the goggles that you're wearing, um, which is a really immersive and engaging flight experience and a real skill. Um, I do want to note that these cameras are totally different than the kind of camera you would want to take photos and videos. Um, on the plus side, they're much cheaper to replace, so the stakes are a lot lower, um, but they're much lower resolution because it's designed for real fast, real-time video feed. The other point I want to touch on too is most racing drones do not come with GPS. It's extra weight, you don't need it, um, but like I said before, we really consider the Ruby-Q to be like a racing drone with training wheels, um, and if you've ever flown a racing drone yourself. I think the benefit of this is pretty obvious. The first drone I ever flew was a full-size racing drone and it was completely terrifying. So if you are out there helping students fly for the first time, um, some of the things that you get with the GPS, one would be some really easy, mellow assisted flight modes that you wouldn't get in a drone that didn't have that support. Um, you can also get some safety features like a return to home where you flip a switch and the drone brings itself back to you. So in an educational environment, um, that's definitely something to consider um, as you have beginner pilots that are kind of working on their skills. The other thing too is drones that are able to carry a payload. Obviously, as you kind of progress and your students have that foundation, it's really cool to have some sort of capstone project. Um, so this was part of a indoor competition that we did with our local technology student association where students had assembled their drone, they configured it, and then they had to design themselves a hook to pick up these, their straws connected by 3D printed attachments and transport them around the course. So it was a skilled piloting and engineering challenge that allowed them to apply everything they had learned and then compete in sort of a team environment. So I have a video here. I'm going to skip over these bits, though. If you want more information about um, what this competition framework looks like, um, this video is on YouTube and I can share it. It's the Idaho TSA Drone Challenge. Um, they're constantly innovating and happy to share with anyone else putting together a drone challenge, but I want to be sure we have time for questions. Um, so Ron, I'll get these slides off so we can take any questions that may have come in as I've been presenting. So we have had a few and I've answered some of them, but we've looks like a couple more rolling in. Okay, so Gary's asking with uh, online hybrid teaching, I'm looking for a cloud-based simulation program. Good point, um, his here program with Python, program that could be downloaded to a physical drone at some point. Um, I'm gonna recommend that you take a look at the session that uh, Marissa Vickery and Dennis Baldwin are doing. Uh, their new version of DroneBlocks does have a simulation built into it. I don't, and I believe it is one the students write, they, the simulation will show you how it's supposed to perform. And then I believe they can transfer it to the Tello and make it fly that. I'm not positive of that. So I would watch that or reach out to Marissa and, and get a little more information from them. So that's the one I did say, I did see. So one thing I did want to bring up and I don't want to stifle any questions is um, what we didn't, didn't mention, which I think is an incredibly important piece for schools or teachers that are starting a program are simulators. Um, 
whether you're starting a CTE program where you want to evaluate the student's performance in the simulator, or you just want to give students some hands-on experience with a simulator before they go out with a real one. So they get a feeling for, you know, the stick movement and kind of the course, what that corresponds to the, to the drone movement. There, there are several of them out there and they're absolutely worth your time to do that. There are some really good ones that are, um, there's one called uh, Zephyr. It's more for like CTE programs. Uh, I know the Dallas School District has, um, is using that. Uh, and the, the teachers can log in and they can evaluate the student's performance. Um, it gives them a mission to perform and then you, the teacher can kind of play it back and see how well they did. There are others that are less expensive. Um, I got someone asking what recommend we recommend. Um, it, let me take a look real quick. There's a couple of them out there uh, that are pretty good. Uh, there are some that are much more basic than others. So uh, there's one I think would be really good and it's inexpensive. I just got to make sure that the company still still has a, a version of it that's available. Um, one thing we have found in the drone business, there were a lot of companies that started off like gangbusters in 2013, 14, and 15 that have kind of faded over time. So it's, so it's a little bit more of a challenge for us to keep up with them sometimes. But, um, but simulators are a great thing to use. And some of the better ones, especially if you're going to teach, um, um, if you're going to invest in racing drones, whether they're indoor racing drones or outdoor racing drones, it doesn't matter. There's some very inexpensive simulators out there for, um, for uh, uh, helping them learn that. And that's a very different kind of flying, like um, Michelle said, um, there's no GPS on them. It's, it's strictly pilot input that controls that aircraft and, and they are more, much more challenging to fly. But like she said, if you've got a semester's worth of time for them to, to, to play with it, then, uh, and to learn, then it's, it's a great thing, especially if you're in an area where you really need to fly indoors. Um, and those simulators, there's um, uh, a couple out there. I'll, I'll post them in here, uh, here in a little bit, or we'll put them, I'll put them in so that in the recording, you'll be able to see them. But um, uh, they're, they're important things to have. I don't know, Michelle, if you had any recommendations on those. Um, for racing in particular, we always recommend FPV Freerider. Um, they have multiple versions, but it's relatively low cost. If kids have a, you know, it, plug-in game control style controller at home, they can even use that. So for a starter skilled piloting, that's one of our go-tos. Yeah. yeah, I agree with that. We've, we've used them as well. And um, Rotor Rush is one that we're working with um, for kind of an enterprise solution to offer to schools that want to set up teams. It gives them a, a way to practice. So that's, that's one of the things that's in our, in our, um, um, in our to-do list of things to put together but uh, they're pretty important. Uh, uh, Zephyr does have a free version, but it's not the enterprise. I, well, I think they have a free version. You'd have to check. Um, there's a couple of them out there that have a free version that'll work for about 10 minutes or five minutes, and then it stops. So that's not overly useful, but nonetheless, uh, it still is, it is something out there. If you want to take a look at it to kind of evaluate it. All right. So, one thing I was going to point out, Michelle mentioned the um, um, drones flying in warehouses. Uh, about a year ago, maybe a little bit more, Amazon was awarded a patent for a flying warehouse. Um, and a flying, and, and if anybody knows anything about patents, they take three to four years, five years to get one, to get one uh, processed all the way through. That means that they applied for a patent probably in 2012 to create a flying warehouse. Now, as far as I know, they haven't built one, and I don't know if they have plans for one, but they have a patent for it. So anyway, that just kind of gives you an idea of some of the industries out there and how far ahead they're looking at things. So. All right, um, we'll open it up. Anybody wants to ask a question, you're welcome to, to jump on. I think your audio is enabled. If you wanna jump in and ask one, if not, if you put it in the chat, we will we'll get to it as well.
Okay. All right. It is right at about just a minute before three o'clock. And I know the next session is going to kick off here in about two minutes. Um, 